We've got the paint, we've got the brushes. That's everything we need, right? Not quite. Painting auxiliaries. The things we need to get the job done, but we never really think twice about. Pallets, rinsing water, paper towels. Simple stuff, right? But there can be way more to them than you'd expect at first blush. Starting with the wet palette, since it's the one that will see the most general use for most people. The purpose of a wet palette is to siphon moisture from a reservoir through a semi-permeable membrane. As moisture is lost from the paint into the air, it gets replenished from below. There's a huge amount of wet palettes on the market. I've got quite a few myself. But in reality, they're also really easy to make for yourself as well. So why not let's do that? There's four key things that make up a good wet palette, at least in my opinion. Some on the market wet palettes skip some of these, and I think it's to their detriment. Every wet palette needs a container, something with a lid, but it doesn't need to be airtight. For this homemade wet palette, I'm using a plastic takeout container from a restaurant. You'll want it to have some depth to get all the other stuff in it, but the closer the top layer can be to the surface without going over, the better. Next up is the sponge. This is what's going to hold the water and wick it up towards the surface. This is what can vary really heavily from market wet palettes, but for me, I like a nice thick sponge that can hold a lot of water. The best I've found for at-home palettes is this charcoal foam, which I can cut into shape to fit my container. It shouldn't be squished in, but sitting loosely, with a bit of room away from the edge. I get this stuff online for model storage, but cheap, flat kitchen sponges will work just fine too, as long as they fit the container. This is the one often overlooked, and that's the guiding paper. Most consumer palettes skip them, since they have very smooth, if thin, sponges already. But what they do for us is hold the right amount of water from the larger storage of the sponge before sending it on up through the parchment. Think of it like a regulation valve, but also leave a flat surface for our paper. The home-built one, just a strong paper towel makes for a perfect guiding paper. Lastly is the semi-permeable membrane. Most consumer palettes come with their own pre-cut ones and can really vary from brand to brand. Red grass, for example, are very thin and allow the paint to flow much more freely across the surface, while the parchment being used in the homemade wet palette will cause the paint to beat up on the surface. Either way though, the trick to getting the paper to remain flat on the guiding paper is to make sure it's cut smaller than the surface of the guiding paper. If there's overhang that doesn't get continuously hydrated, it can start to dry and curl up more of the edge. When it comes to where to find parchment paper, I know it's not a simple task for everyone, but I do know many corners of the world have Costco's, and my favorite brand for this is the Kirkland one. If that's a bust though, try the cake decorating sections of hobby shops. While your supermarkets might not stock it, it is a pretty common accessory to cake baking. When it comes to how much water you need to hydrate your paint, it can really depend on your environment. Air humidity plays a huge factor. As someone that lives in a very dry climate, a slightly damp sponge will just be dry half an hour later. In a tropical region, you may never have to add water. So figure out your humidity and the less humid, the more water you'll need. That is half the beauty of the guiding paper and thick sponge system though. As long as there's enough in the reservoir, the guiding paper will be replenished from below. So for the homemade palette, it's best to leave a gap somewhere where water can be refilled as it evaporates off. I wanna break some cliches about wet palettes that get circulated quite often starting with the idea that it'll make paint and mixes last forever. It won't, nor is it supposed to. The idea is only to make paint last longer during a painting session, but once the lid gets closed and a hot house is formed, after a while, too much paint binder will be replaced by water, changing the way the paint will behave. So usually when I'm done for the night, I'll replace the paper and let a new one soak for a fresh start the next day. 
There is good news to that though, in that if you find your palette starting to dry out on you, by closing it up for 15 to 30 minutes, it should pull moisture from the guiding paper into the paint and get it the right consistency again. If you have a problem with the opposite end of the spectrum and the paint is always pulling out too much moisture, then only keep the sponge damp instead of flooded. And just be aware that things like slow dry medium will change the paint in a way that it draws more moisture from the semi-permeable membrane, which means the paint brand or the paper being used could also be the issue, so try switching those out, or mixing in some medium to equalize the mix. Despite how great a wet palette feels in application, it doesn't mean it works for everything. Washes, glues, pigment powders, crackle and chipping mediums, texture paints, none of those particularly need a wet palette. So what do we use instead? Plastic weld palettes are the norm. The wells actually help to pool paint at the bottom, preventing them from drying out as quickly as a flat surface palette, which also makes it easier to get them into the brush. The more paint in a well, the more time it'll stay viable, so they're good for large batches of washes. A flat surface of any type can be used as a palette, and in fact, the top lid of our homemade wet palette would absolutely work as a flat palette as well. But for a more advanced flat surface, a ceramic or glass tile offers a bit more, particularly in the cleaning department, as even paints with less acrylic binder in them that normally don't come off easy can be cleaned away simply with a scraper or washed easily in a sink with warm water. Why we might want to use a flat dry palette over a wet palette would be for a few reasons. Non-typical paints like texture paints don't really need the benefit of a wet palette but still might need a bit of thinning for one reason or another. The other reason is for opacity or dilution control of a paint. When on a wet palette for long enough, in a humid environment, water pulled from the wet palette into the paint would dilute out the pigment. With a dry palette, it's up to us to give it any additional moisture, so we can control the dilution of the solution. The only trade-off is the paint will eventually dry and become unusable, so we'll need to be replenished if not finished with it. And for a final tip on how to easily clean a weld palette, a cheap bottle of satin varnish. Spread thick in each of the wells and allowed to fully dry can easily peel up the whole thing. That's acrylic polymer at work. Everyone's got their favorite water, mug, or jar. And that should be the end of this section. But there's actually quite a lot of nuance to paint water, and I don't just mean the flavor. For nuance number one, it shouldn't be one paint water cup, but two. When rinsing off brushes after mixing, painting, or general use, the water gets really, really filthy. And if you replace your water all the time, that's not an issue, but we're rarely that proactive. In the two cup system, we wash our brush in a dirty cup, then rinse out again into clean water. This allows us to use our water far longer than we probably should. I also know some painters like to use two cups for a different reason. One for paint and the other for metallics. However, this system allows use of both in the same rinse without worrying about contamination of colors with metallics still. Nuance number two is that we really want enough water in our cup to rinse out the brush without ever touching the bottom. I like reusing tall bubble teacups for this. When we rub the brush on the bottom to clean it, we end up bending the bristles back and forth, which can accelerate the wear on the bristles. With a tall enough cup, that temptation disappears completely. The last nuance is that any water we use for painting should never actually come from our water cups. Especially the tall cups should be kept way on the edge of the painting area so they don't get knocked over with wayward hand motions. But since that water is filled with pigments of all types, it's always best to have a bottle of fresh water solely for thinning or refilling the palette to keep the pigments on the palette as pure as possible. First off, I need to explain what wicking paper is for. When we fill the brush on the palette, the bristles love to soak up a lot of paint. 
I mean, that's why we use certain types of brushes over others. But a flooded brush isn't good for painting details. For that, we want the point of our brush back. By wiping the brush on some paper towel or tissue, it draws out the extra moisture and brings back the brush to a point. It's also really important for glazing, as you want the solution in the brush to be quite thin. Otherwise, it's not a glaze, but a wash. By drawing out the moisture, we can get an even coat of a thin or diluted paint on a flat surface. When it comes to what tissue to use for this, it depends on preference. I prefer something really absorbent, as they give the most control over brush moisture, but then they're not as strong and will bleed onto the surface of the work area or start to disintegrate if too wet. Paper towel holds moisture better, but doesn't draw out as much from something small like our bristles. So this is my super professional, expert, industry secret for how to choose. Put the absorbent bathroom tissue on a piece of paper towel. The absorbent one for dealing with the actual paint and mixes, while the paper towel is good for holding moisture so it doesn't bleed through, and its strength for dealing with dry brushing or brush cleaning purposes. I'll leave more detailed instructions on how to build a homemade wet palette in the description below, so there won't be any need to stop and start the video. And of course, let me know what you like to use when it comes to your painting auxiliaries that I may have missed in the comments. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one, or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.